Seven strange things that are occurring this year. Number one, preparation for the mark of the beast. The rate of improvement of technology this year has been off the charts. This obviously makes room for the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? We all have specific numbers that are important to us, like a favorite athlete or a birth date. The mark of the beast appears in Revelation. The term mark of the beast refers to a mark brought into existence by a man known as the beast. His rise to power will be slow and subtle, going unnoticed even by those closest to him. He will emerge from the common people. The beast is a human individual who accepts the satanic offer, which Jesus refused. But he is also anti-Christian in the other sense of that prefix. He has the power to make war against the saints and to overcome them. His characteristics are those of other fierce beasts, leopard, bear, and lion, human or divine. He seems to arise from a federation of political rulers, gaining the world's attention through an astonishing recovery from a fatal wound, presumably in an attempted assassination. His blasphemous egotism is broadcast for 42 months. His position is bolstered by the second beast, a religious colleague with supernatural power who focuses the world's worship on his superior. His miracles will deceive the nations as he commands fire to fall down from the sky in images of the dictator to speak. His appearance will be like a lamb, a young sheep with only two horns. According to the Bible passages in Revelation chapter 16, verse 2 and 19, verse 20, the mark of the beast is a symbol that distinguishes those who worship the beast out of the sea. Revelation shows us the economic strategy of the first beast and the second beast. He causes all to receive a mark. A mark will be given to everyone under the government of the beast and his associate. This mark is necessary to participate in the economy, and those without it will not be able to buy or sell anything. Only those bearing a special number on a visible part of their body hand or forehead, will be allowed to trade and the number will only be marked on those who engage in imperial idolatry. The number 666 is the coded name of the dictator. A mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. Satan is not a creative being. All he can do is imitate God. The Antichrist is described as a man whose appearance was greater than his brothers, according to the prophet Daniel and the apostle John. The Antichrist will possess a charismatic personality, excellent speaking abilities, and good looks, making him extremely attractive to the masses. John also stated that everyone alive will be required to worship him, adding to Daniel's account of the Antichrist's blasphemous activities. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, the Antichrist is referred to as a beast, which is an accurate description of his character. The use of numbers as symbols is quite common in various contexts. In the book of Revelation, the number seven appears frequently, associated with stars, lampstands, lamps, seals, trumpets, and bowls. It is considered a significant number in the Bible, representing completeness and perfection. The number 12 is associated with the old tribes of God's people and the new apostles, while the number 24 brings them together. 1,000 is the largest number. 666 is the one that captures attention. It is made up of sixes, a figure that always alludes to the inability of humans to achieve the seven that represents complete perfection. What is the Antichrist? The Antichrist is a person who opposes Christ. The term anti can also mean instead of, and both meanings apply to this coming world leader. Additionally, he will openly oppose Christ while pretending to be him. The Antichrist will do everything possible to live up to his dreadful title. During the Battle of Armageddon, led by Satan, he will persecute, torture, and murder God's followers. He will be the most powerful tyrant the world has ever seen, surpassing the likes of Caesar and Hitler. Does the mark of the beast exist today? Many of us wonder if the mark of the beast in Revelation 13 will be a high-tech tattoo or the plan of a billionaire. The Bible makes it very clear what the mark is and when it will happen. To begin, there is a strict timing requirement for the mark. Scripture teaches that the mark of the beast will appear at a particular time and place in history. But at this point in time, 
we have not yet arrived at that time or place. The Mark of the Beast is called so because it is created by a man referred to as the Beast. Hence, till the Antichrist gains power over the entire world, there can be no such mark. According to the Bible, the Beast and his mark will not appear on Earth until the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. Therefore, any suggestion that a mark of the beast exists today in any form is just a forewarning. Number two, underground bunkers. Does the Bible mention current events such as billionaires building bunkers? If so, does it indicate the fulfillment of end time prophecies mentioned in the Bible? Explaining the subject involves addressing three complex puzzles. Let's break them down in simpler terms and discuss how they relate. Puzzle one. Prophecy. Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 through 16. Then the kings of the earth and the eminent people, and the commanders and the wealthy and the strong, and every slave and free person hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hold us from the sight of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The bunkers appear in Revelation 6. And Revelation chapters 6 through 16 covers Satan on earth. This particular segment of the book is the crux, the very heart of the matter, and can be quite challenging to comprehend. Unfortunately, we have now reached the most unpleasant part of the book, the worst judgment. The situation will deteriorate significantly before any improvement can be seen. The scenario depicted in the upcoming chapter is grim. However, it is reassuring to know that the scenario depicted in the book is the worst it can be. The reader can take solace in the fact that things will only get better from here on out. Nevertheless, the upcoming chapters are distressing enough to make one feel uneasy. The bunkers are mentioned as part of prophecy, yet to be fulfilled as they are part of the seven seals. The seven seals are part of God's end of the world judgment. Revelation chapter 6 verses 1 through 17 gives us more information. Even though we see the result of the bunkers in Revelation 6, the action begins in chapter 5 of Revelation. On that fateful and dreadful day, a sense of terror and fear would grip people from all walks of life. The apprehension and anxiety would be palpable as they face the unknown and uncertain future that lies ahead. The sheer magnitude of the impending doom would be overwhelming. No authority, nor grandeur, nor riches, nor valor, nor strength would be able to support men at that time. Yea, the very poor slaves who, one would think, had nothing to fear because they had nothing to lose, would be all in amazement at that day. At the time being referred to, no amount of authority, grandeur, riches, valor, or strength would be able to provide support to the people. No bunker or fancy steel cages would feel safe enough. Even those who were considered to have nothing to fear would be filled with a sense of amazement on that day. The situation would be so overwhelming that I would wish for it all to crash. Take a moment to behold the scene before you and note the extent of the fear and amazement displayed by those present. Their reactions are undoubtedly intense and palpable, a testament to the gravity of the situation. In times of this extreme hardship, their emotional state will become so intense that it may lead them to feel as if they are being pushed to their limits. The weight of their problems and troubles may become so unbearable that they may feel as if they have no other choice but to give up. The situation becomes so dire that people are driven to the point of desperation. They even wish for the mountains to fall upon them and the hills to cover them. They would prefer to disappear completely and cease to exist. Also observe the cause of their terror, namely, the angry countenance of him that sits on the throne and the wrath of the Lamb. All individuals are equally humbled by the wrath of God. This judgment is especially profound since it is the wrath of the Lamb. It is the fierce anger of love, the anger of selfless love that has done everything that is possible for our salvation. This anger tells us with absolute certainty that evil will eventually be destroyed by God. They say in their bunkers, Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. People don't just hide from the fear of punishment, but also from the very sight of the Almighty who reigns in heaven. The thing that terrifies sinners the most is not just the thought of dying, but the intimidating and overwhelming presence of God himself. 
The statement emphasizes the inseparable unity between Christ and God. It suggests that anything that causes displeasure to Christ also causes displeasure to God, as they are one and the same. This implies that the will and intention of Christ and God are identical, and they share a single divine purpose. Although God is invisible, He can make the inhabitants of this world aware of His severe displeasure. Although Christ is often depicted as a gentle lamb, it is important to remember that He is capable of anger, even to the point of wrath. The wrath of the Lamb is extremely terrifying, as if the very one who saves us from God's wrath becomes our enemy then who will plead for us? Those who fall victim to the wrath of the Redeemer will be without hope. Their fate will be sealed with no chance of redemption. This is the very bottom of hopelessness and despair. Throughout history, it has been observed that individuals are presented with opportunities and periods of grace to make amends for their sins. Similarly, God also has His own day of righteous wrath, a day where all sinners will have to face the consequences of their wrongdoings. This day will be so dreadful that even the bravest sinners will not be able to stand before God. The people of Judea and Jerusalem experience the terror of this day during their destruction, and it will befall all unrepentant sinners on the day of the final judgment. The anguish, fear, and despair that will be experienced by sinners on that day will be beyond measure. The Wrath of the Lamb in times of trouble, humans will desperately look for shelter and safety wherever they can find it. It is at such moments that the fleeting and temporary nature of human existence becomes evident. The upheaval in the sky is not just an ordinary occurrence, but a warning of a greater terror to come. It is the expression of God's wrath, a terrifying and awe-inspiring force that is beyond human comprehension. The wrath of the Lamb is an unusual phrase that terrified people, used to describe the calamities they experience. It's worth noting that they do not view the Lamb of God, who gave His life for human, sin, or God, who sent His Son to die as the cause of their calamities. Number 3. April 8. Eclipse Is April 8 solar eclipse related to the end times? On April 8, People who are interested in watching the eclipse are getting ready for a total eclipse of the sun. This eclipse will be visible from a large part of the Midwest and even the southernmost corner of Michigan. It's a very interesting event, providing an opportunity to witness a rare celestial phenomenon that happens once in a lifetime. However, there is a main question that many have, and that is, is April 8th solar eclipse related to the end times? Certain groups claim natural, predictable, and regularly occurring events as signs of God's judgment upon the world. However, it is important to consider whether such warnings should be taken seriously. Can natural astronomical events fulfill end-time prophecies and serve as indicators of God's judgment and the end of the world? During a solar eclipse, the sun appears to go dark due to the alignment of the sun, moon, and earth. However, the moon does not turn red during this phenomenon. On the other hand, a blood moon occurs during a lunar eclipse when the sun, earth, and moon align. But this does not cause the sun to go dark. Therefore, it is unlikely that Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 is referring to a solar or a lunar eclipse, as both events would have to occur simultaneously for the verse to hold true. In addition to this event, there will be other celestial signs such as the stars of heaven falling to the earth, which are most likely meteorites and every mountain and island being moved out of its place, which is likely the result of powerful earthquakes that will shake the earth. Revelation chapter 6, verses 13 through 14. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as a fig tree drops its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. The real heavenly signs will be global, unmistakable, and totally unnatural. They will be caused by God's direct intervention, not the natural alignment of earth and moon. These heavenly signs will mark the beginning of a prophetic time period called the Day of the Lord. This future time period will be preceded by other prophetic events that have not yet transpired or come to their fullness. What is wrong with date setting for the end times? Throughout history, many individuals such as self-proclaimed prophets, well-meaning preachers, and outright swindlers have made predictions regarding the date of Jesus' second coming. However, all of these predictions have been proven wrong 
Despite their certainty, the proclaimed date would come and go without any sign of Jesus returning. This serves as evidence that those who made these predictions were not genuine prophets. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 21 through 22. And if you say in your heart, how will we recognize the word which the Lord has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, and the thing does not happen or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You are not to be afraid of him. Jesus said that no one knows the day or hour of his return, but some try to guess by saying they can get close. God has chosen not to reveal the exact time when Jesus will return. This is because he desires us to live our lives by faith and for his glory. He intends for us to be actively involved in our communities. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, to serve our churches, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7, and to raise our children to know and honor him, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. Have any aspects of end times prophecy been fulfilled? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 marks the beginning of a section in the scripture that talks about future events that are yet to take place. These events include prophecies about the end times, such as the tribulation, the revelation of the Antichrist, and other similar occurrences. Although we haven't witnessed these events yet, we can sense that there is a preparation going on for them. The happenings during these end times will be two-sided according to biblical prophecies. Scripture points us to the fact that it will be gloomy on one side, yet glorious on the other side. There will be great confusion for some, while there will be great assurance and confidence for others. However, the definite path we will walk on during these perilous times will be based on our individual choices and attitude towards what really matters. In Malachi chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of armies so that it will leave them neither root nor branches. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and frolic like calves from the stall, and you will crush the wicked underfoot, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I am preparing, says the Lord of armies. There is a need for the spirit of faith to be actively at work in us, so that we aren't caught in the devastating web that has enveloped the world in these last days. Number four, red heifer prophecy, the complete truth about the red heifer. Many have recently been discussing the red heifer in Israel, and it has resulted in many people thinking that the return of Jesus is near. Why is this? What is the significance of a red heifer in relation to the end times? It is important to understand the significance of a red heifer in the Bible before we explore that question directly. To fulfill the mandates of the Old Testament law, a red heifer was required for the purification of the Israelites from uncleanness. To be more specific, the ashes of a red heifer were required. In Numbers chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the statue of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel that they bring you an unblemished red heifer, in which there is no defect and on which a yoke has never been mounted. And you shall give it to Eliezer, the priest, and it shall be brought outside the camp and be slaughtered in his presence. And Eliezer, the priest, shall take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle some of its blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. And the heifer shall be burned in his sight, its hide, its flesh, and its blood, with its refuse, shall be burned. And the priest shall take cedar wood, hyssop, and scarlet material, and throw it into the midst of the burning heifer. The priest shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward come into the camp, but the priest will be unclean until evening. Chapter 19 of the Old Testament deals with using the ashes of a red heifer, considered one of the most potent symbols of cleansing. This offering was meant to remove defilement caused by coming in contact with a dead person, particularly in the case of the children of Israel, who had just rebelled against the Lord at Kadesh. As a punishment for their unbelief, they were sent out into the wilderness to die, with over 600,000 people dying in 38 years, equivalent to more than 40 people per day. Given the circumstances, it was nearly impossible to avoid contact with death, which highlights the need for the ashes of the red heifer.
Many believe that the appearance of a red heifer today is a sign of the construction of the third temple and the return of Christ, as the ashes from a red heifer were necessary for the purification rites held at the temple. According to rabbinic tradition, nine red heifers have been sacrificed since the time of Moses, but none have been slaughtered since the second temple's destruction. According to the teachings of Rabbi Maimonides, the tenth red heifer would be sacrificed by the Messiah himself. The Temple Institute, an organization that advocates for the construction of a third temple, has reported that five perfect red heifers from Texas. Many people see the acquisition of a red heifer as the fulfillment of prophecy, as it is a significant step towards building a new temple. According to the Mosaic Law, the red heifer used for sacrifice had to be free of any defects or blemishes, and it should never have borne a yoke. Numbers chapter 19, verse 2. The sacrifice was unique in many ways. It used a female animal. It was performed away from the entrance to the tabernacle, and it was the only sacrifice where the color of the animal was specified. In the futuristic timeline of eschatology, it is believed that a third temple of God will be built in Jerusalem. According to Jesus' prophecy, the temple will be desecrated during the tribulation, and for that to happen, there will need to be a temple in existence. If the builders of the end times temple follow Jewish law, they will require ashes of a red heifer mixed with water for ceremonial cleansing. If a red heifer without any blemish has been found and is in Israel, it could be a significant step toward fulfilling biblical prophecy. Before the rapture occurs, it is not necessary to find a red heifer. Jesus could return at any moment to receive his own. The occurrence of the rapture is not dependent on the existence of any specific cow. Is it necessary to find a red heifer before rebuilding the temple? Temple advocates desire a temple for ceremonial purposes, but animal sacrifices aren't required today. No, Jesus has fulfilled all the requirements of the law, and his sacrifice provides true forgiveness and eternal life. Will there be an end times temple in Jerusalem? The Bible mentions that some end of times events will occur in a temple in Jerusalem. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, it says, And he will confirm a covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come the one who makes desolate until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, gushes forth on the one who makes desolate. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, speaking of the Antichrist, it tells us, Who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and so insolently above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. Upon seeing the temple's construction, we can be sure that the end times are near. Number five, people are changing. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. The word perilous connotates the idea of troubles, difficulty, and stressful situations. This kind of atmosphere will characterize the final days. The word perilous was used in classical Greek, both of dangerous wild animals and of the raging sea characteristics of the last days that Paul will describe is not the times, but of the terrible people in those times. We should note what the hardness or danger of this time is in Paul's view to be, not war, not famine or diseases, nor any of the other calamities or ills that befall the body, but the wicked and depraved ways of men. The last days is a broad term in the New Testament, so broad that it could be argued that the last days began with the birth of the church on Pentecost. Though some believe that paying attention to the last days or biblical prophecy is frivolous, we should be able to discern when the last days are, or at least when world situations are like the Bible described they would be in the last days. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 1 through 4, Jesus chastised the religious leaders of his day for failing to understand or refusing to understand the significance of their times. And in the morning, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but are you unable to discern the signs of the times? Matthew chapter 16, verse 3. 
It is possible that Jesus would have the same rebuke for some Christians today who are unaware of the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. Paul gives a description of the human condition in the last days. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Men will be lovers of themselves. This is definitely typical of our present age when people are motivated to love themselves. It is no accident that the first of these qualities will be a life that is centered in self. Love of self is the primary sin from with all others flow. The point a man makes his own will the center of life. Divine and human associations are destroyed. And obedience to God and charity to men both become impossible. Lovers of self aptly tops the list because it is the essence of all sin and the source of all other characteristics. The term literally means self-lovers, and it refers to the fact that the natural man's center of gravity is himself rather than God. Men will be lovers of money. The love of money is nothing new, but today individuals have the ability to chase our love of money like never before. Men will be boasters proud, blasphemers, boasting, pride, and blasphemy are nothing new, but they appear to be more prevalent than ever today. Boasting and blasphemy each act as if I am the most important person. Each of them say, you don't matter and God does not matter. All that matters is me. Today, boasting, pride, and blasphemy can be found everywhere, especially among our culture's idols. Today, many people become wealthy through calculated boasting, pride, and blasphemy. Men will be unthankful, holy, unloving, unforgiving. These traits have characterized humankind to varying degrees since Adam. These things, according to Paul, will be especially prevalent in the last days. Unloving, translated without natural affection, literally means without family love. According to Paul, the end times will be marked by a growing disregard for normal family love and obligation. Another characteristic is that men will be slanderers. Men have always told hurtful lies about other men. Men will be without self-control. The story of no self-control can be noted across nearly everything today. Lust, pills, alcohol, food, work. Whatever we do, we often do it out of control. Men will be brutal. Cruelty and brutality are nothing new in the world. However, Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the final days would be marked by a particular brutality. Men will be traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. These features are all about one thing, self. Men are traitors because of self. They are stubborn because of self. They are haughty because of self, and they are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God because of self. We are not required to choose between pleasure and God. Serving God is the greatest joy. According to Psalm chapter 16, verse 11, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. However, we must choose between the love of pleasure and the love of God. Many pleasures will come from living for God, but only if you love God first and refuse to love the pleasures themselves. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. People in our self-obsessed world feel very free to practice a salad bar religion, picking and choosing what they want. They are free to be very spiritual, but they do not feel obligated to be biblical. The power of godliness that men will despise in the last days is the power it should have to guide their lives. Power in the sense of rightful authority. And numerous today reject that God has the power to tell them what to do through his word. For such people, turn away. The command to avoid people who exhibit the characteristics listed in this list is especially difficult in our current age. People who do the things on this list are not only common today, but they are often cultural heroes as well. Christians have a simple responsibility to turn away not only from these attitudes, 
but also from those who practice them. Many give little heed to the company they keep, but if we spend time with individuals like this, either personally or by allowing us to entertain us, they will influence us. As Paul noted in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. For among them are those who slip into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. Those who creep into households. Paul was aware that such dangers existed in the world during his lifetime and that they would become even more prevalent in the last days before the return of Jesus Christ. On the other hand, he appeared to be particularly concerned that these would find their way into households. It is one thing for such evil to exist in the world. It is quite another to welcome it into your own home. One ought to examine themselves to determine whether or not they are, in fact, one of the captives referred to by Paul who are held captive by the influence of this end times rejection of God and celebration of self. There is one particular way to know. Walk away from any kind of worldly influence and see if there are chains that make your escape difficult. Try going a week without bringing anything that is associated with the spirit of the last days into your home and observing whether or not it is possible for you to break free of the chains that are holding you to those things. Paul also says, Led away by various lusts. Clearly, the spirit of the last days appeals to us by arousing various lusts within us. It appeals to our desire to be stimulated or to have our desires for comfort, wealth, or status satisfied. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The spirit of the last days has a specific intelligence about it. The high priests of the spirit of the last days know how to make things work and how to lead us away by various lusts. But despite their skill, marketing brilliance, and knowledge, they never arrive at the truth. Indeed, the spirit of the last days has a problem with the idea of true truth altogether. An example of this sort of corrupt human condition, Janus and Jambres, who resisted Moses. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8-9, through 9, Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men of depraved mind, worthless in regard to the faith. But they will not make further progress, for their foolishness will be obvious to all just as was that also of Janus and Jambres. Janus and Jambres. Though they are not named in the Exodus account, these two men are the Egyptian magicians who opposed Moses in front of Pharaoh. Janus and Jambres resisted Moses. They were able to perform true miracles, not mere parlor tricks, but only through the power of darkness, not God's power. Janus and Jambres could do the same thing that Moses did when he threw down his rod and it turned into a serpent. They could do the same thing he did when he turned water into blood. Janus and Jambres could summon a plague of frogs in the same way that Moses did. However, they were unable to match God miracle for miracle, and their occult powers were revealed to be inferior to God's power. The ability to perform miracles through the power of darkness, as well as the willingness to accept them as genuine, will characterize the end times. Number 6. Wars and Rumors of Wars what will the last days on earth be like? Have you ever paused to wonder about the ultimate fate of our world? What will the last day on earth be like? This video is going to be an exploration of this intriguing and profound question. Prophecies of the End Times The last day on earth has indeed been a subject of fascination and speculation throughout human history. Jesus provided a clear description of the end times, marked by various signs and events. It emphasizes the fundamental uncertainty regarding its exact timing. There are various phenomena that would come before the end. These include false prophets, wars, and rumors of wars, famines, and earthquakes in various places. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 8. These events are often interpreted as the beginning of birth pains, suggesting a period of escalating commotion leading up to the end. Wars and rumors of wars. He mentioned that there would be wars and rumors of wars, but advised not to be alarmed as these things must happen, but the end is still to come. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. 
Some Old Testament stories draw connections to the concept of the end times, as depicted in the New Testament. One such story is the rise and fall of kingdoms in the book of Daniel, particularly in Daniel 2 and 7, where the prophet Daniel interprets dreams and visions that symbolically represent a series of empires and conflicts. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had a dream about a statue made of various materials, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and clay, representing different kingdoms. And after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to you, then another third kingdom of bronze, which will rule over all the earth. Then there will be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron, just as iron smashes and crushes everything. So, like iron that crushes, it will smash and crush all these things. Daniel chapter 2, verses 39 through 40. This dream symbolized a sequence of empires and the conflicts and wars associated with their rise and fall. In the New Testament, Jesus and other writings often spoke of wars and conflicts as signs preceding the end times. Number seven, the gospel preached worldwide. The gospel preached worldwide. An important sign before the end is that the gospel will be preached in the whole world. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14. One of the key narratives in the Bible that exemplifies the concept of the gospel being preached worldwide is the story of the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys. Paul's travels, as detailed in the Acts of the Apostles, showcase the spread of the gospel across different regions of the ancient world. Paul, originally known as Saul, was a committed persecutor of Christians. However, after a dramatic conversion experience on the road to Damascus, where he was struck blind and heard the voice of Jesus, Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 6, he became a fervent preacher of the gospel. Paul embarked on several missionary journeys throughout the Roman Empire, which are chronicled in the book of Acts. He traveled to regions such as Asia Minor, Macedonia, Greece, and eventually Rome preaching to both Jews and Gentiles, for example. For the Lord has commanded us, I have appointed you as a light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. Acts chapter 13, verse 47. Throughout his travels, Paul not only preached, but also established churches in various cities. His letters to these churches, like those to the Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, make up a significant portion of the New Testament. Paul's missionary work played a crucial role in spreading Christianity beyond the Jewish communities and into the Gentile world, making it a truly global faith. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, Jesus said, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. This prophecy indicates that a global spread of the gospel is a sign of the approaching end times. By taking the gospel to different parts of the known world, Paul's missionary work can be seen as a fulfillment of this aspect of Jesus' prophecy. His efforts contributed significantly to laying the foundation for the worldwide spread of Christianity, which continues to this day. These signs, as described by Jesus, serve as a guide to understanding the events leading up to the end times. They emphasize a period of confusion and challenge, but also highlight the importance of steadfastness and faith and the global spread of the gospel. Paul's teachings emphasized faith in Christ as the path to salvation, preparing the way for Judgment Day. He traveled extensively, enduring hardships and persecution, to share the message that faith in Jesus Christ offered redemption and a promise of eternal life. His letters to the churches he founded form a significant part of the New Testament, elaborating on Christian doctrine, including the concept of divine judgment. The connection between Paul's work and Judgment Day lies in the idea that by spreading the gospel, he was essentially preparing people for the final days. His emphasis on faith, repentance, and living a life reflective of Christ's teachings aimed to guide believers toward a favorable judgment when that day comes. In essence, Paul's life mission was not just to convert individuals in his present, but to influence countless generations towards a path that would ultimately lead them to face their final judgment with hope and assurance in Christ. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you with hearts open and eager to delve into the depths of your word, the Bible. We recognize that within its pages lie the keys to understanding not only our world, but also ourselves and most importantly, you. Lord, 
We ask for clarity as we seek to comprehend the truths woven throughout the scriptures. Help us to see beyond the words on the page and into the heart of your message. May your spirit illuminate our minds and hearts, guiding us into all understanding. Grant us wisdom, O Lord, to discern the meaning behind the stories, parables, and teachings. Help us to grasp the historical and cultural context in which they were written so that we may apply their timeless principles to our lives today. We pray for humility as we approach your word, recognizing that our understanding is limited and flawed. Keep us from pride and arrogance, and instead, cultivate in us a spirit of teachability and receptivity to your truth. Father, we acknowledge that studying the Bible can sometimes be challenging. There are passages that perplex us, doctrines that seem difficult to grasp, and teachings that challenge our preconceptions. In those moments of confusion, grant us patience and perseverance. Help us to trust in your guidance, knowing that you will lead us into all truth. We lift up to you those who are new to the Bible, those who may feel overwhelmed or intimidated by its vastness and complexity. Surround them with supportive communities and mentors who can offer guidance and encouragement along their journey of faith. For those who have been studying your word for years, renew their passion and excitement for scripture. Help them to approach each passage with fresh eyes, eager to uncover new insights and revelations about your character and your plan for humanity. Lord, we pray for unity among believers as we engage with your word. Help us to recognize that while we may have different interpretations and perspectives, we are all part of the body of Christ. May our discussions be marked by love, respect, and a shared commitment to seeking your truth. As we delve into the depths of your word, may it not merely be an academic exercise, but a transformative encounter with your presence. May the truths we uncover sink deep into our hearts, shaping us into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Finally, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for revealing yourself to us through its pages and for the countless ways it has touched and transformed lives throughout history. May we never take for granted the privilege of having access to your word and the freedom to study it openly. We come before you today with humble hearts, seeking your guidance and wisdom as we embark on the journey of understanding your word, the Bible. You have given us this precious gift as a lamp to guide our feet and a light for our path. We ask that you open our minds and hearts to receive the truths you have laid out for us within its pages. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.